this year, Cricket Magazine has sent our TV show, Tales from Cricket Corner, complimentary issues of their journal. This is the magazine for the month of September. And as you can see, it has a wonderful tiger on the cover. Now, they are featuring a lot of stories about the country of Korea, because in Korea, tigers have a special meaning. And this is one of the stories that they tell in Korea about tigers. A long time ago, when tigers still smoked pipes, the singing and dancing people of Korea suddenly stopped singing and dancing. A great sadness had come to their land of morning freshness. Floods came over the land, washing away their crops, and it looked as if they would have nothing to eat. So the king said, oh, we must all bake bread and, and give the bread to the, the household gods, and, and they will stop the floods. So the king opened his granary and gave a little bit of grain to everyone in the country. And everyone baked bread, and they offered the bread to the household gods. But still, the floods came. It was not working. We need stronger magic, said the people. And then from the mountains, a wild man came down dressed in skins, and he said, we need the magic of Manco, the mighty tiger. Yes, said all of the people. If the tiger were on our side, we would get rid of these terrible floods. So the people dressed in tiger skins and roared like tigers. And they invited the artists to come to their land. Now, artists had no permanent home. They were always the guests that stayed in your house and, and drew pictures just for you. And the people said to these artists, draw us lots of pictures of tigers. So the artists drew many pictures of tigers. They drew ferocious tigers. They drew smiling tigers. They drew tigers smoking pipes, giggling tigers. And they put pictures of tigers all over the country. Every household had a picture of a tiger. And the palace had a great big picture of a tiger. And on the temple, they put a picture of a smiling tiger because they didn't want people to be afraid when they went to the temple. And the magic of the tigers worked because the floods subsided and the grain grew again in their land. And the people always remembered the strength of their mountain tigers. Now, Cricket Magazine has not only stories, but it, it has factual material, too. So this beautiful picture of the tiger here gives a little bit of the history of what tigers meant to the people of Korea. Tigers have roamed the mountains and hills of Korea from the earliest times to Koreans long ago. Tigers symbolized strength and courage. Pictures of them were seen everywhere, on clay roof tiles embroidered on children's clothing, even on the hats of the palace guards to show their fierceness. Most popular of all were the tiger paintings that were pasted to each palace gate to chase away evil spirits. Each year, new tiger paintings were created for the palace, and wandering painters came from all over the country to copy the style of the palace artists and add changes to create their own tiger door guardians for ordinary houses. These paintings are now called folk art because they were made for the daily use of all the people in the country. Today, both real tigers and tigers of folk art are disappearing from Korea. Modern Koreans look to science instead of seeking animal magic, but tiger beliefs are still at the root of their culture. Korean tiger paintings are treasured throughout the world. Because of this, the Korean mountain king will never become extinct. Well, today we're very lucky because we have our very own traveling artist who came to visit us. We have David Ostroff here, who is busy drawing a tiger that will protect us, I guess, from all sorts of evil things that might happen. He did all of the tigers that are up here. Um, this one 
is not colored because it's a, a white tiger, right? Yeah. David's been drawing pictures for a long time. How many of you were with him in, say, kindergarten or first grade? Yeah. Was he drawing pictures then? Yeah, I bet he was always drawing. Yeah. What, what animals do you like to draw best, David? Yeah, yeah. Well, he's doing a wonderful tiger here. In um, Oriental art, not just from Korea, but also in China and Japan, they have a lot of beliefs that just a picture of something has magical powers. And I'd like to tell you the story of the boy who drew cats. Once there was a, a farmer who had a lot of children. And all of the children were big and strong, except for the youngest son. He was kind of small, and he was kind of special, because he liked to draw. As soon as he could stand up and, and hold a stick, he was drawing pictures in the dirt. And people said to the farmer, that son of yours should be a priest. You must send him, send him to the monastery, to the temple, and the priests will teach him. So they sent the boy away at a young age. But what he really liked to do best in the temple was draw. And what he liked to draw best was cats. He drew cats everywhere on, on his paper that he was supposed to be learning writing on, uh, on the walls of the temple. Well, the day that the chief priest unrolled the sacred scroll at the high altar, and saw that the sacred scroll was covered with cats. He said, that boy should not stay here any longer. So he had the boy brought before him. And he said, you shouldn't be a priest or a monk. You should be an artist. I would like you to go to the city and become an apprentice to an artist. But before you go, I have a special warning for you. At night, avoid open places. Stick to the small. Well, the boy didn't know what he meant. And he was so embarrassed that he'd been sent away from the monastery. What were his parents going to say? So he kind of wandered off by himself. And he went down a long, deserted road, and he found a temple. And the temple was deserted. He thought, maybe I could get a job there, sweeping up. When he opened the door to the temple, he saw that there was dust and cobwebs everywhere. No one had been there for a long time. The reason no one had been there for a long time was that the temple was haunted by a goblin. Every night, the people heard terrible screams coming from the temple. But the boy didn't know this. He went inside the temple, and he looked around, and he looked down at the altar. What did he see? A great big screen that was white and empty. <laughs> so he took out his charcoal, and he ran over to the screen, and he began to draw cats. He drew cats everywhere, cats standing up, cats sitting down, cats lying down, cats fighting all over the screen till there wasn't a square inch that didn't have a cat on it. <laughs> then he was tired, and he decided that he should go to sleep. He was about ready to, to lie down right there in front of the altar when he remembered what the priest had told him. At night, avoid open places. Stick to the small. So he looked around for, for a small place, and he, he found a little cupboard. It was empty, and he crawled in and went to sleep. And in the middle of the night, he was awakened by terrible noises. It sounded as if a great fight were going on with amongst terrible animals out there, growls and, and awful noises, and he was frightened. He stayed hidden, and the light that had been glowing in the temple all night suddenly went off. He was too frightened to peek out. He waited until the first rays of the morning sun awoke him, and then he opened a tiny door, and he saw that the floor of the temple was covered with blood. And then he saw, in the midst of the blood, the dead body of the goblin, its throat 
had been chewed. Who could have killed the terrible goblin? There was no one else there in the temple. And then he looked up at the screen, and he saw that the mouth of each cat was stained with blood. And then he understood that in the middle of the night, those cats had come to life to protect him from the goblin. And he understood also why the priest had warned him to stay out of the open at night and stay in a closed, safe place. Well, the boy grew up to be a very famous artist. And today, if you go to Korea, they will show you pictures of the cats that he drew. But for the rest of his life at night, he always stuck to a safe, closed place. Who is it the picture of the tiger that you've drawn? Oh, see? Isn't that good? Can you make this one come to life? <laughs> you don't think so? That certainly would protect us, right? Mm. In Africa, mankind's cradle of life, children are starving to death. Famine has left more than 35 million people desperately hungry. CARE is bringing food and other critical supplies directly to the people who need them. Please help. Call toll-free 1-800-457-0400. Now we're going to move from Korea to Vietnam. There is a book um, called The Land I Lost that was written by Win Kwong Yung and is a series of his memories of his life growing up in Vietnam. He lived in the central highlands of Vietnam with the mountains on one side and the river on the other side. And during the rainy season, all of the people in his very small village were farmers. But when the dry season came, they turned to hunting. And the four animals that they feared the most were the tiger, the lone wild hog, the crocodile, and the huge horse snake that seemed to kill just for the joy of killing. Now, the author thought that he would go to the University of Saigon and, and come back and, and live in his village. but. The Vietnamese War ended all that. And now all that he has left of his boyhood in Vietnam are the memories. And this is a true story. Next door to the author's grandmother, there lived a widow who had a very pretty daughter named Lan. Now, on the other side of Lan's house, there, there was a, another widow, and she had a son named Trung. Now, Lan and Trung had known each other ever since they were children. But when they grew up, they began to notice each other and see how attractive they were. And every morning, Lan's mother would find a freshly caught fish that Trung had left in her windowsill. And when Trung's mother heard Trung calling out Lan's name in his sleep, the two mothers said, let's get these children married. So they arranged for a wedding to take place. And they were going to celebrate the wedding with all of the proper traditions. As the wedding day dawned, first, everyone went to Lan's house. Trung's family came over and all of their friends and relatives. First, they worshipped at the altar of Lan's ancestors. And then they had a special wedding luncheon. And after that, they went over to Trung's house. Now, sometimes it was traditional for the bride to cry and scream that she didn't want to leave home. But <laughs> Lan was just going next door, so she didn't see that there was any need for her to protest. It's like she could go home whenever she wanted to. So they went over to Trung's house, and they worshipped at the altar of his ancestors. And then they had a great big wedding feast. And then everyone left. And it was time for the wedding night. But Lan decided she would take a bath first, and she went down to the river to bathe. Now, at that part of the river, there were a lot of crocodiles, and it was very dangerous. So the fishermen had built a trap to keep the tro crocodiles out. But as Lan was taking a bath, a wily old crocodile climbed around the trap and took her 
Well, Trung waited and waited for his new bride to come back from taking a bath, and she didn't come. So she, he went down to the river, and all he found was the pile of Lon's clothing. And he called for his friends and relatives to, came, to come, and they came with torches, and they found the print of crocodile claws. And they said to Trung, it is of no use. She has been killed. A crocodile has taken her away. But Trung would not leave. He cried and cried for his beautiful bride that had just been stolen from him. He stayed there a long time. And at last, he heard, coming across the water, the sound of Lan calling his boy, his name. There was a belief that when a crocodile had taken you, your spirit had to lure another victim to the crocodile, or your spirit would roam the earth forever. So he wasn't sure if, if that was really Lon or if it was just a ghost. So he called for the rest of his relatives to come back a second time, and they listened. They heard nothing. They said, come back with us. Lon is dead. You will never see her again. But Trung would have none of it. He stayed by the river all night long. And as the sun was coming up, he heard Lon calling his voice again. And he looked out, and he saw a, a little island about 600 meters from the shore. And he saw something that looked like a tree that was jumping up and down and calling his name. And he called for his relatives. And they all hopped in a boat, and they paddled out to the island. And Lon was alive. She, she dressed herself in leaves, because she'd left all of her clothes back on the shore. And after she stopped crying, she explained what had happened. That crocodile had picked her up and thrown her to the ground right away, and she'd been knocked unconscious. And if she hadn't been unconscious, she probably would have thrashed around so as he was swimming out to the island with her that she would have drowned. But since she was unconscious, she got to the island, and she was still alive. And then the crocodile <coughs> began to toss her up in the air and smash her to the ground to soften her up the way crocodiles do with their large meals. And after he'd thrown her up and down a little bit, he went to the river to get a drink of water. And she managed to climb a little tree. Well, when the crocodile came back, he bellowed and howled because he'd lost his dinner. But after a while, he swam away in the river. And that was when Lon decided to call for Trung. And she called for her all night long. Well, they took Lon back home and they examined her. And she didn't have any cuts. She didn't have any broken bones. All she had was a lot of bruises. So she slept for three days. And at the end of that time, she was as good as new. Well, those two mothers decided that they would have a second wedding. So it, it was like Lon had come back from the dead. So they celebrated the wedding again. And then all of the guests went to serenade the bride and groom at their wedding chamber. And they waited and waited for Lan and Trung to open the window and thank them for singing. But they never opened the window. And that is the story of Lan and the crocodile. And I think David has drawn us a picture of a crocodile. Let's see. Ah, so here is a crocodile that David has drawn. Now, I have one last story that is told in both Vietnam and Korea. There was a woodcutter. He went into the woods every day. He was very young, and he always enjoyed the trees and the silence that met him in the woods. One day when he was there, he found a cage. And within the cage were two beautiful white birds. He couldn't bear to see them penned up like that. So he opened the cage, and they flew away. Well, the woodcutter moved to another village, got married, had two children. And 25 years later, he began to long for the woods he had known as a young man. And he kissed his wife and children goodbye and went back to the woods where he had grown up. He enjoyed the trees. They were as lovely as he had remembered them. But he roamed the woods all day long, and he couldn't seem to find his way out. It wasn't the same as, as he had remembered, and, and he was lost. And night came, and he was still trapped in the forest. Far ahead, he saw 
a light in a house. He didn't remember that there was any house there. He went to the house and knocked on the door. No one answered. He pushed the door open. And there was a beautiful young woman. She had white, white skin and huge gleaming eyes and long hair. And she said, come in. I will feed you dinner. The woodcutter didn't know he was so hungry. She put before him a bowl of rice, a bowl of vegetables, and a bowl of spiced meat. He ate them immediately and would have eaten more. Then he looked around. The woman was no longer there, but he heard. <sniffs> and there on the floor was a huge snake coiled with its head up. And as he stared into the snake's eyes, he realized that the woman and the snake were one. And the snake said, I have waited for you for 25 years. I owned those two white birds you released long ago from the cage. And now for that act, I am going to kill you. No, please, said the woodcutter. I didn't know they belonged to you. I just couldn't bear to see them deprived of their freedom. Nevertheless, I will kill you at midnight, said the snake. Uh, isn't there something I can do to, to get out of this, to have you not kill me? There always is a way. Yes, said the snake. In the midst of the woods, there is a deserted temple with a huge bell. If the bell rings 12 times before midnight, you may go free. Let me go ring the bell at once, said the woodcutter. No, said the snake. You may not leave this house. Then how shall I ring the bell, said the woodcutter. That, said the snake, is your problem. And she went away. The woodcutter closed his eyes and he pictured a temple. He pictured a bell and he pictured it ringing as hard as he could and then he listened and he heard nothing. And he knew that he could not ring the bell. So he resigned himself to die. And he thought of his wife and he thought of his children that he would never see again. And then at five minutes before midnight, the snake reappeared. And she said, now prepare to die. And just then, the woodcutter heard, bong, bong, bong. The temple bell was ringing. Who could be ringing it? No, said the snake, bong. And the bell rang 12 times. And the snake and the house disappeared. The woodcutter was so exhausted, he fell down asleep. But as soon as the sun rose, he searched for the temple. And he found it covered with vines. He opened the door, and there was a bell. How could the bell have rung? He looked beneath the bell, and he found white feathers and blood and the bodies of two white birds. He picked up the birds. The hearts were still beating. He wrapped them in cloth and fed them until they were well and strong again. And then he opened the door to the temple and let them go a second time to their freedom. And the woodcutter went back home. And he was always thankful to the birds for giving him his freedom, too. Now we have a snake here. Mm. Here's a snake. Thank you, David. Those were pretty good stories, weren't they? You like that one? These are great. <laughs>